it, <laughs> I'm not sure where I should be, if I should be on stage or down on the ground. Good morning, my name's Frank, how are you? Uh, like most of you this morning, I got up, went to the bathroom, used the toilet, took a shower, brushed my teeth, went downstairs, had a cup of coffee. Does everybody do that today? It's pretty much a typical morning in the States, right? Um, um, it's just amazing, and I was very humbled on this trip to Haiti, uh, which is the poorest nation in the West, Western Hemisphere. Uh, it deals with issues of water scarcity on a daily basis, and I have it steps away from where I sleep at night. Um, close to 70% do not have direct access to drinkable water. Um, lack of income also um, contributes to this problem. The average person, 78% of the population lives on about $1 to $3 a day. So afford, water is just not really even affordable. Uh, so people resort to gathering from garbage filled rivers, streams, um, wherever they can find it basically. Uh, during our drive through the city of Bercy, um, the city's just really, it's like a concrete jungle. Concrete everywhere, not much green or anything. And I love the people watching, it's definitely a people watching city. And I looked over at one point and there was this little old lady sitting on the sidewalk and there was a big chunk of broken concrete out um, in that area where there was no concrete. There was just a little puddle of water and she was just sitting there with a bowl, scooping it with her hand, trying to get as much in the bowl as she could. And I just thought to myself, I wonder what she's going to do with that water. Um, again, access to clean, fresh water is a concern. Uh, where waterborne illnesses such as typhoid, cholera, chronic diarrhea are the cause of more than half the deaths in the country every year. Contaminated water is also one of the leading causes of childhood illness and high infant death rate in Haiti. About 57 of every 1,000 births, um, the babies die, and it's about 6 out of every 1,000 in other countries. Uh, accessing water is not easy. Um, Edie and I found this out one day. Uh, one of our translators, John Pierre, we visited his house, no bigger than maybe a eight by 10 foot uh, cinder block home with a tin roof. And then he took us down the mountain to one of the water spots where they, you know, they get water, there's a spring up there um, that people can get water from. So he took us down there. It was a pretty treacherous kind of walk path maybe 12 inches wide in some spots and a sheer drop on one side, really rocky, slippery. So we finally get there, it took us about 30 minutes and um, you know, we sat around for a few minutes and then guess what, we had to walk back and it was all uphill. So it was quite a battle, not very easy to do. Um, people there do it every day and this is what plumbing's like in Haiti. This is your plumbing system. This is where you get your water from. You go to the spring, you fill it, and you carry it on your head back to wherever you're going. Uh, I did a little research. The statistics are up in the air, but uh, they say anywhere from each person daily uses anywhere from 80 to 100 gallons of water each. Uh, most of it used for toilets, showers, and you know other things, washing clothes. Uh, could you imagine carrying 20 of these a day? I mean, somebody has to do it, right? Just a little something to think about. Uh, our team, with your help and donations, were able to deliver 120 water filtration systems to the surrounding community of Percy. We had morning classes educating the families on how to put them together, maintain them, and how to build them. Um, they were supplied by a company called Sawyer International. 
the technology is taken from uh, the same technology used in kidney dialysis machines. Uh, it allows water to enter, keeps all the bad stuff out. Um, as you can see, in the, I know I had some pictures up there. As you can see, it, uh, it comes out perfectly clear. And Bill was our guinea pig. He drank the he drank the filthy water and he survived. Um, the fillers are also amazing. They they some of the bacteria they catch are cholera, botulism, typhoid, amoebic dysentery, E. coli, coliform bacteria, Streptococcus salmonella, uh, Giardia, Cyclosporidium, Cyclospora. So. I mean, this is kind of what they're dealing with there. To give you the visual, that's what they gather. And our filters make it come out like this. Nice, clean, drinkable water. It is really amazing. With proper maintenance of the filter, uh, it can last 10 years. So um, it's kind of a pretty cheap deal and uh, worth every penny as long as it's maintained. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, Brittany Rusk, our team leader, was at the morning uh, service. She sent us a letter last week saying that we raised above and beyond our goal for filters. The excess allowed us to fund a project um, to deliver filters to communities that are not accessible by the team. Um, so we're excited to hopefully get things distributed to our translators. They can get them out to where they need to go um, so people have access to clean drinking water. Uh, and she specifically thanked Butler UMC, Freehold UMC, Repal UMC, Medford, and other personal um, donations. And just one last thing. We heard last year that a gentleman walked through the night about six hours um, just to come and get a filter, you know, to help his family. So. That's it. Thanks. Hi, my name's Edie. I was going to say I'm going to try and keep my emotions under control, but <laughs> that's just I can't do that. Um, as I attempt to return to my normal life, um, the children in Percy really haunt me. Um, I wonder when we return because of the mortality rate, if all of those children will still be there. Um, and walking up and down that um, uh, to that spring, uh, I had two men on either arm, and I don't consider myself that out of shape. But if I had to survive by getting water at the spring, I would not survive because I couldn't do it by myself. And the children carry about two gallons. The adults carry five, the children carry two. Um, we had a really good experience when we had our community day. We walked up to the mountain to a flat field that we rented. Um, it was a huge success, although extremely chaotic. We had beads for the girls to make bracelets. We had hair bobbles for them. We had balls, which the children just love. They called them bolos, they all wanted their own. Um, we had coloring books and crayons. Uh, when we opened up anything that we had, even pipe cleaners that we used to make little dolls, they were gone in minutes. I mean, they just, they craved anything we had. It was just amazing, these children. Um, we did try and do a snack, which was really difficult. Um, we tried to have a line. It was just completely chaotic and we actually had to stop. Everybody was so hungry, they all kept getting back in line and it was hard to just, you know, give the little kids their, their snack first. Um, so after our game day, we went back down the mountain and we walked into a church and the church is very, very small and the pews were just filled with mostly young children and older people and in the front was the smallest of the children. Um, we actually had to have Frank at one of the doors and Bob at another one because the young men started to come and they were really hungry so they really wanted to come in but we wanted to serve the children first. So as Bill and I started to serve the kids, Madam Lulu, who at first went in and started the children singing and clapping and it was just such a sense of community, started dishing out the food for them. And it was a paper plate, but it was piled high and 
it was amazing because some of these children sitting in the front were like two and three years old, and they had this huge plate of food that I would have trouble eating. And we kept saying, you can give a smaller portion because they're children, and we're not going to be able to feed everybody. And she didn't pay attention to us. She just kept piling these plates, rice and beans, a little bit of chicken. And uh, these children ate it all. It was amazing. I'm um, not sure when the last meal was, probably the last time a mission team came, last full meal. Um, and as we get nearer to the end, there was about five or six rows left, and Bill and I kept looking at the pots, and it seemed to be when one big giant pot of rice disappeared, another one just came. And we were just kept saying to her, we're going to run out. I mean, these boys are at the door, and everybody's so hungry. And this didn't make a difference. She just kept piling them on. And as we got near the end, whether it was Madam Lulu's experience in giving these community meals or whether it was a little bit of divine intervention, there was enough to feed everybody. It was really amazing. But a passage comes to mind, and it's Matthew 14, 13 through 21, and it says, When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him in foot, from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's getting late. Send the crowds away. They need to go to villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. Give them something to eat. We have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fishes, looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. As the disciples picked up the 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over, those number of those who ate was 5,000 men besides women and children. So every time I opened my cupboard or my refrigerator, I think of those children in Percy that had nothing to eat. They followed us around like little puppies and said bonbon because that's what they called candy. They were just craving attention, craving food. So every time you go to the refrigerator or your cupboard and you're not really hungry and you're just getting something to eat, think of the poor children in Haiti who have absolutely nothing. And their next full meal may come when the next mission team comes in February. Thank you. Bonjour. This is how our Haitian friends exchange greetings with us each day. Other French Creole words that they traded back and forth, that we traded back and forth, were bonsoir, which is good afternoon, merci, which is thank you. Beyond this, there were many times that our language skills failed us, that we couldn't understand each other but a smile truly is the universal language. And the smile or lack thereof, particularly in the spaces of children, said much more than words can say. The smiles and welcoming by the Haitian people was outstanding. Percy is a place of true wilderness and beauty and with living conditions unlike most Americans can comprehend. The people of Percy and Patientville gave us their unconditional trust and friendship, even though our smiles belied, even though their smiles belied the most challenging poverty. As a team member new to Haiti, I was truly amazed at the level of trust and faith that the Percy people imparted on our little group. From the Haitians, we were always treated like neighbors friends, and family. As a dad, it was extra special having my daughter there with me to share these experiences. It was the best Christmas gift that I could have asked for. Seeing my interact with the children of Percy was such a joy and life-changing for both of us. 
It is one thing to be a 63-year-old doing this work, but quite another to be 18 and feeling and expressing the same things. Maya and I both want to go back to the mission of Haiti. I hope our youth will be able to pass this message along and see her doing this. There is a legacy of hope that our youth will carry the mission of clean water and ending poverty wherever there, wherever, whether here, Haiti, or around the globe. I invite you to now hear about this life-changing event from my daughter, Maya Carlson. Please run the video. Hi everyone, I hope you're having a wonderful morning. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person to talk and see you all, but hopefully I'll be able to in May. Uh, this morning I'm going to discuss our trip to Haiti, specifically focusing on my interaction with the children and mostly how I think I affected them and how they affected me, etc, etc. Also, sorry if you hear a noise over there. I think someone is taking a shower and it, it's very noisy, so much apologies for that. Um, so the first day in Percy was very eventful to say the least, um, for reasons that either have been or will be explained to you by someone else. Um, but the highlight of the day for me was meeting some of the local kids um, who I would later come to know as Vladimir, Clarence, Otsin, Kievins, Jovance, and Fala, Fara or Fava, I don't know, there's been some debate over what her name actually is, so for the sake of avoiding headaches, I will call her Fava. Anyway, um, I had a book filled with pieces of paper that um, had instructions on how to make uh, these like little pieces of paper into airplanes, and the kids didn't really understand and not gonna lie, the directions were kind of difficult to the point where I was struggling. So instead we made our own paper airplanes um, and the children really enjoyed throwing them around and seeing who could throw them the farthest. Um, and in addition to that, um, Emma and Kate, who are from North Jersey, uh, they brought decks of cards. And um, the kids don't really know how to play card games, so instead we just took them and we were making like houses of cards and everything and they got really excited. and. Uh, if the cards like fell down, like they would just pick them back up and like keep remaking them and it was just really cute. And then afterwards Emma and I would take pictures of them, um, which made the kids smile. And they always like to look at our phones and like look through our pictures and look and like watch all these videos. So that was always a good part of the day. Um, I think the following day um, was the first day that we were doing the water filtration classes. And Emma and I were in the back of the church um, with some of the kids and we were handing out little um, toy cars and there were like coloring books and everything and um, crayons so that they could color in the books um, while their parents were like occupied um, taking the class for the Walter Fertilation and I was amazed by how much like this tiny little toy car uh, that seems almost maybe even insignificant to some kids here in the US was basically like winning the lottery for these kids um, they valued those things like they were diamonds and the same reaction like happened on game day when Brittany handed me a bag full of beads and um, string to make bracelets and literally once I opened that bag it was completely empty in five seconds. Um, but it was nice to see all these girls wearing all the little necklaces and bracelets that they um, had made and all the kids like carrying around um, all these little arts and crafts and they had like stickers on their faces and you know um, that they had made at like the different stations at game day. Um, as a quick side note, I just wanted to point out how amazing the amount of trust is that the parents have in the children over there. Um, one day I had the opportunity to go to the primary school, um, and little Fava grabbed one of my hands and her brother Clarence grabbed the other one, and um, we just like walked down together down to where the school was. Um, it wasn't too far, but um, I think uh, um, that it was interesting. Yeah, sorry, like brain fart right there. I think it was interesting how their mother, um, who was one of the cooks, like didn't even mind that her kids were had just like left and like came with us to the school. Um, because like in the States, when your kid goes missing for a couple seconds, you're like, you begin to think of the worst case scenarios. Um, whereas people in that community knew that their child was probably somewhere on the mountain. Um, and that being said, it's probably due to, in part, to being in the countryside as opposed to the city. But regardless, the communal feel that you... Um, like experience um, is very different than what you would um, expect or experience in the United States, for example. Um, overall, I really enjoyed being in Haiti, um, especially in Fursi. 
it's not even so much the materialistic things that made the children happy, but just us being there and interacting with them and saying hello. Um, I felt that even a small gesture like smiling or talking with them was more valuable than just me giving them a dollar and letting them be on their merry way. Um, and not only did I have an effect on them, but they definitely had an effect on me. Like being in Haiti made me evaluate my life back home more than I used to. Um, and it mostly occurs nowadays when I go to the dining hall with some of my friends and I'm now that person that lectures everyone when they don't finish their food. You know, we'll be sitting there and I'll be like, you know, there are kids in Haiti who don't have food, so I don't care if you don't like it, you eat that broccoli, et cetera, et cetera. And then I met with like these, are you kidding me looks? And then I'm just like, no dude, I'm not kidding. Um, but anyway, so there's definitely a lot more I can say about the trip, but that would take me a couple of hours and I definitely do not have that time. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. And um, yeah, I hope you all have a wonderful day and I look forward to seeing you guys when I come back home. Um, and if any of you guys have any questions or anything, feel free to ask any of the people like my dad, Edie or Frank um, or anyone else that was on the trip, um, any questions that you may have or you can reach out to me and you can just ask my parents for all that information. And yep, yeah, that's it. So au revoir and bonne journée everyone. I'm Anne, and any of you that saw our first presentation, I've cut my 90% of my speech. <laughs> I'll be mercifully short here. Now, I, I'm focusing on church and school, and uh, anyway, we spent, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the activities, as you can see from the pictures, were involved, uh, were centered at the church. And the church was like within a hundred yards of our bunkhouse and our and our clinic, meaning Methodist. Uh, that was our little compound there. Anyway, we were we were advised before the trip that Sunday was a super dress up day for the Haitians and that we should be prepared to dress up for church. So we dressed nicely, including the women all donning skirts, along with the sneakers we need to negotiate the rough. Uh, last, say, three quarters of a mile walking downhill into the Fursey compound. Uh, the ride out to Fursey that Sunday was fascinating. More, uh, a lot of continuous walled compounds along the little streets, but with many dressed up and headed for their respective churches. This is, we started out in the city. Uh, as we left the city with our luggage following in a separate truck, we continued to see many people dressed up and walking along the dirt and rock roads. Many times it looked as if we were going to sideswipe someone or something, and there was the occasional motorcycle with a dressed-up family riding it together to their church. As many as three or even uh, four on the motorcycle uh, headed to church. It was pretty cool. When we arrived at the spot where the dirt and rock road would no longer accommodate anything but the occasional motorcycle, and of course the people on foot, our truck stopped. We got out and walked down the rest of the way with the Fursey folks carrying our luggage on their heads. Pretty amazing. Uh, as we walked past the church on our way to the bunkhouse to claim our luggage, we, we saw, heard that the church service was already underway. So we placed uh, our luggage in the bunkhouse and headed back up the hill to attend whatever remained of the church service, which turned out to be like another hour or something. They, so they apparently have f fairly lengthy church services. Uh, we att it was very cool attending the church service alongside the native Haitians in their finery. It was, it was moving and something that you know none of us will ever forget. The service was uh, similar to our own and recognized... Uh, we recognized several of the hymns, which were accompanied by a pastor on a harmonica and also a young man playing the violin who was standing off to the side. And you couldn't see these people at first. I thought it was a boombox. I heard some little, like, light music. And then all of a sudden I was like, whoa, there's a guy back there playing harmonica. But the singing was, was really heartfelt. You know, the folks were... Uh, uh, really into it, sung beautifully, and it was just an experience. Anyway, uh, then a couple days later, I guess my pictures are done already. <laughs> a couple days later, we, we went, uh, 
we were dragging suitcases of school supplies and snacks down the, down the same trail or down a trail uh, away from the mission to teach a class at the primary school as it was now a weekday. After a brief meeting with the school principal, team members Kate and translator Angie uh, skillfully and very enthusiastically played out a children's story about a frog and an alligator for two different classes of children. The kids were appreciative, uh, maybe especially of the candy, Edie mentioned the candy, <laughs> and they enjoyed uh, playing soccer and getting their pictures taken on this uh, a little concrete court at the side of the school between the, uh, the classes. That was on their lunch break ball would roll down the hill and one of the boys would run down and get it and bring it back. Uh, the rest of us in the classroom, we would, uh, we helped the folks put together paper bag puppets, help the ki little kids and um, it was, it was quite an experience. You had to hang on to your supplies or they would, they would find their way, you know, somewhere where nobody could use them. They did, <laughs> they loved the purple glue and whatever else. Uh, so that was an enjoyable experience. And uh, I'll just mention that uh, word had it that the teachers at the school make about $90 a year and haven't been paid in several years. So if anyone's feeling sorry for themselves in the United States, maybe maybe rethink that. I don't know. Uh, it made it made us wonder about a little bit about unempowered and misdirected government, that that could be the case. but. The children wore uniforms. I think that there was a picture that showed them in, in par at least partial uniforms, yellow uh, shirts and things. Uh, after leaving some booklets, snacks, and, and puppet supplies and having our hearts lightened by our apparent success, our little caravan proceeded back up the hill to our mission. Uh, lastly, we did have uh, church. They had church revival meetings. The Haitians did several nights while we were there. And uh, it was interesting because you could hear them from the house. Again, when I first heard it, I'm thinking, oh, someone has a boom box on somewhere because we'd have electricity for two or three hours a day. And people would put their phones on a charger and things like that. But anyway, so, so it, was, it was just very moving. They had an open mic sort of a thing. And folks of all ages would get up and perform some hymn or other. And we all sang together as well, and here we were out in sort of the nowhere, in the middle of the night on top of a hill in a little Haitian church with hard wooden benches, and it was very, it was just very moving. It was one of the more emotional uh, things that I experienced, just thinking, what is this for? Why are we, you know, they, they're enjoying themselves. These, they, they love it. It's social as well. And uh, actually, I did just want to say that course we hoped we helped some folks along the way they certainly helped us in a number of ways uh, as Frank said we were very humbled by the experience and I'd like to thank uh, all the people involved Kathleen not individually but a lot of people involved in a mission trip like this uh, Kathleen brought the idea to us from the Greater New Jersey Conference and uh, Brittany who ran our trip and all the Haitian contacts including our translators and our uh, cooks. So, anyway, see Kathleen if you want more information. <laughs>